Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the all-in-one cloud-based e-learning authoring tool for teams. You can learn more at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Chat, we know your Wednesday is feeling a little better. Well, we hope it is. <laughs> Maybe we're depressing you, though, with our dancing. It's not really good. <laughs> but it is Wednesday, and it's it fun is. to see all the weather reports coming in from around the globe. Well, apparently it's sunny in Ireland. Um, I didn't know that actually happened. Is that a common thing? I, <laughs> I, I picture everything being green, including the sky. And maybe that's just my naivete. Uh, and, and why are you people inside if it's sunny in Ireland? No Shouldn't you be out there enjoying it? <laughs> uh, no kidding. Well, no kidding. well it's, it's a great beautiful. day here. It's a great day here where I am. Feels like spring. Sort of. I don't know. Spring's dragging on. It's just not... Not coming to a a wrap up yet fast enough for me. Oh, we're well into summer here in Arizona. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rub it in, as always. Yeah, there's nobody else here that's going through that probably. But, uh, you know, despite the sunny, warm, beautiful weather, things are always changing and happening all the time. And uh, as you all can notice, uh, Debbie did not grow a beard. (laughs) <laughs> she did decide uh, that she's got a client that she has to take care of, and good for her. If anybody needs uh, consulting, you can trust that she will put off two of the coolest guys and their show to go take care <laughs> of her clients. So uh, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> I, I think I think you meant to put air quotes around that last. Oh yeah, sorry, there. sorry, uh, yeah. I, for, I forgot to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No well, we do have a guest that isn't Debbie Richards today. Chris, who are we chatting with? Folks, we have uh, Lee Gregory sub- subbing in for Debbie. And what's really cool is um, Lee's going to just pick right up on the exact same topic that we had scheduled for today, talking about VR and training and those sorts of things. Um, Lee, you, it's, your, it's your first time joining us. So introduce yourself to the folks. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, good to meet you, everybody. I'm actually just north of London, so it's not particularly sunny here, um, to be honest, but hey, it will get there, I'm sure. So um, I'm actually responsible for our commercial activities at a company called Immerse. So we are an immersive platform and our our sort of strap line is we're leading the immersive ecosystem um, for VR effectively. So and, and what that really means is we're trying to pull together all the different participants in the industry to create immersive learning and to make it a lot easier for organizations such as yourself to participate and actually get the value from it. So hopefully I'll be able to share some kind of insights today, um, what we've seen changing over the last 12 months, which is considerable, and how those barriers to entry have actually come right down. So, yeah, really looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, very cool. It, VR, we were saying, you know, in the green room, and Brent was pointing out that he did VR, he helped create VR related things um, a while ago. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Don't use the it, catchphrase. It, no kidding. Um, but it, and so it is something that, that uh, you know, over the course uh, of, of, of the last couple of decades, it, it pops up. And then it kind of, you know, wanes in, in our space of the L&D space, et cetera. It, it gets a profile um, and then it kind of fades down a little bit. And then suddenly it's back on the, you know, uh, the conference circuits, uh, circuit topics lists and those sorts of things again. So it, it does have a bit of kind of a roller coaster, you know, history with, you know, within our space. Um, let me just ask, what was kind of how far how far back or what kind of, um, you know, starting point did you have in, in this space? So me, I've been here 12 months, literally 12 months. So um, I've got a technology background across many industries, a a number of different disciplines. So when I left my last organization, um, I just randomly said to my wife, the next 
business that I want to go into, I really want to be involved in, in virtual reality or, or immersive technology. And by coincidence, I got a call the next day from Immerse and sort of like the rest of history. So I've seen a lot <laughs> of it totally new. And yeah, I'd like to think I've learned a little bit over the last 12 months and see some big changes. So what's really happened there was your smartphone was listening in and that yep. connected to your LinkedIn account, which pinged somebody on their algorithm. And <laughs> it's the... that, or my wife called somebody and said, yeah. Get my hair. <laughs> he's, he's home a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> can somebody help, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. neat. It's a, um, it, it's, it is, it, it's interesting. Jennifer mentions that, uh, she also was working with it in the nineties, which is, uh, which is fantastic. I, I never thought I'd run into anybody ever again that did it, uh, back then the same time I did. And she mentions it's the Holy grail. And I can remember thinking the exact same thing back then when we built it, I built it for the semiconductor industry, uh, back then. And it was, it, it was very rudimentary, very simplistic, but from an instructional design perspective and from a learning perspective, um, I, I did see some just uh, amazing differences in how we did training before and how we were able to use that tool and that platform. We didn't even use the goggles and the headsets and everything. It was just mostly interactive 3D uh you know is was what it was but it was a virtual space you could walk through and all that kind of stuff but i won't i won't get into that but um you know it seems like how let's not talk about the last 12 months maybe because of your unique perspective on this well you know what did you think about virtual like before you got into it before you realized and thought to yourself you know hey i want to get into this field what was your you know say 10 years ago what were you thinking about um, it, was it on your radar <laughs> kind of I, I tried it before and i thought that's that's great but it's still missing something it seemed quite clunky um up and even just until but i joined immerse i was still thinking that you put on a vr headset and it's gonna be like minecraft like really blocky and all that sort of stuff so um and i just thought there's kind of a lot of friction associated with it so it's actually it's a bit of a sort of sorry story in some ways. When I was going through the interview process of Immerse, I hadn't been in a headset for some time. I was like, it's a bit disingenuous. I've not been in a headset for some time. So I went up to a local store, bought one, stuck it in my head. And I, I've got to say that I was blown away. My kids were blown away. My, my wife was. We, we just couldn't believe how far I'd come. And it's when I realized then that I could see how it kind of fits into the immersive learning space. So it's, yeah, it's come a long way. Chris, so have you put the headset on in a while? So um, about, well, COVID's been two years, so somewhere maybe a couple of years before that. Anyway, um, when the, uh, when the was it the Oculus? Anyway, the, the, that, that headset that kind of jumped up back on everybody's radar, we actually did uh, get a, a set and a, a rocking computer to run, them, run it <laughs> at, the, at the Domino office. And, uh, you know, we did some playing around with it. Everybody on the team took turns uh, strapping the, the the goggles on um and then i think uh, more recently than that i actually did spend a bit of time um with a group in the canadian department of national defense that uh, was doing some really neat things using vr um, around their training program so sort of honing in the first experience was basically sort of the default games and 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 you know those, those simple those those experiences that come with the with the Oculus originally, but then seeing it actually um, with the DND um, in in some realistic training kind of programs, I was like, okay, this is this is definitely more than just a, a game or a fun or a toy or a, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah, it, what what we found is it's it's use case dependent, right? So if you don't have the right use case, it just becomes a very expensive technology that doesn't achieve mm -hmm. anything. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. They're probably the examples where we've seen people sort of take some missteps in the past. And then it's not the use case that gets the blame. It's actually the technology. And then they kind of get burnt by it and they don't really want to do anything about it again. So we, we tend to be quite resolute around, you know, what is actually going to work. You've got to start off with a slam dunk use case, prove your point, and then you earn the right to experiment a bit further thereafter. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be sort of like working sort of very, very well. Be clear about what your objectives are going to be. 
and actually how we're going to get you there. Um, yeah. VR specifically is if if you're not doing something, there's no point. If you've got a headset on and you're just watching something, there actually <laughs> means that you've got to be doing, moving right. every 15 to 20 seconds and having an interaction. So Yeah, yeah. Well, the, and the L&D world has a, a, let's call it a tradition of, of taking the way we do something and then something new comes along and basically trying to, too often anyway, do the same thing, but with the new tool. And I think of, you know, Second Life, where where uh, one of the things that people were doing were setting up classrooms in Second Life, so people could sit around fake desks, you know, pseudo desks, um, and and listen to a lecturer, or even just in our own space of, of e-learning courses, taking you know voiceover narration because now we have a, a lecturer, but we can change the slides automatically with a forward button, you know. So so we we take you know we, we have this thing that set of skills, we see this new thing, and we kind of then just uh, our first initiate initial uses of these things is to just reinvent the thing that we we've already been doing so yeah certainly you know and even with some of the uh, you know the shots of uh, the facebook slash metaverse you, you know that some of the talking points that people could you know join together in the same room i'm like okay do we all have to have fake bodies and and you know in in a room together in order to in the case of say l d be able to you know learn some information etc so it really does feel like um sometimes they um the initial reaction in our space to some of these tools is to just do the same thing, but mm, let's let's use this new tool to do it. Yeah, and I, I, I steal this term off a, of a colleague of mine, but I think it really sums it up. So if you think about the different immersive technologies, start off with 360 degree video. We say that see the job. So you just see you see something that's going you know, happening. You then use virtual reality to learn the job. So you're in an actual headset, you can't see what's going on in the real world. And then augmented reality is when you're wearing some glasses or an iPad or something, you've got a digital overlay, that's on the job. So it's like an assisted technology. So we kind of try and put them into those buckets and mm. actually kind of crystallizes it quite nicely when you look at it like that. Very cool. Yeah, Very yeah cool. it's like, I think that's why they started calling it mixed reality because there are those different levels, right? And the, the different ways that they can be applied. And I think we're still, um, we're still working towards sorting all of that stuff out. Um, and uh, of course, you know, Chelsea asks the, the million dollar question that we might as well just go ahead and jump into right now. You know, what, what are those ideal use cases, right? Have you, um, I mean, obviously it's if you're doing something, right? So we, we mentioned that, but um, you know, are there particular areas that you've seen uh, that seem to be making the most sense and are the best use cases for a, a virtual reality implementation? Yeah, and that's a, it's a good question. And these ideal use cases being sort of stretched a bit more all the time, but without question, health and safety. So if you're doing anything where you're learning to keep yourself safe and you can actually witness a a large impact event, whether that's a major injury or the, the cost of human life, and you can do that in a safe environment with no consequences, that is proven to reduce, you know, health and safety related incidents. So that is an absolute no brainer. Um, you know, do that all the time. Um, when it comes to um, processes, so manufacturing processes, we work with, you know, pharmaceutical organizations where they train people to get on the tools before they get on the production lines. Um, and they see results around reduction of training costs, reduction of waste of materials, reduction of PPE, um, more drugs going out to the marketplace and actually impacting um, patients' lives. So they're actually really good examples of making processes more efficient, um, for sure. So we're seeing a lot of that. And interestingly, around people skills, so communication skills, um, whether it's dealing, dealing with conflict, um, gender bias, um, a lot of the big matters at the moment, we're seeing a lot of organizations, especially uh, in the L&D community, looking to roll those out across the enterprise, not just in niche parts of the organization, but across the enterprise. So, yeah, they're, they're strong use cases. I, I've seen some fantastic use cases, too. This is more on the medical side, but um, exposure training for people who have fears, right? And like, if you've got a 
an irrational fear of dogs or something, getting in a VR space and being exposed gently to virtual dogs, you know, for example, or snakes or spiders or something or flying even, right? Yeah. Walking somebody through the process of getting on a plane and trying to stay calm and sitting down in your chair. And, uh, you know, I think the psychology industry has made a lot of great use cases along those lines. It, it's a little bit different, but the, the reason why I, I always read up and I'm always curious about those cases is, is that it's a, it's a mental change, right? You're trying to help somebody change uh, the way they think about something or the way they act or behave when they're doing something. And that's really what we do as learning professionals too, right? We're, we're trying to change a behavior in an environment. And when, when you've got a tool like this, that is so powerful and focusing somebody on an activity and doing something and giving them that ability to practice without fear of, you know, killing a million dollars of product or killing yourself or killing others. If you're training as a pilot, that whole balance, it, it, it really it pays off and it does seem to be so valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've seen yeah, a lot of specialist organizations really dial in on mental health side of things with, you know, yeah, absolutely. I guess, yeah, is it the psychology and everything around it with real specialist skill sets around it, um, making some big impact. So, yeah, it's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of use case, but I'll give you an example of a, what we don't think is a good use case. So a lot of people come to us go, oh, we want to teach cyber security. So, you know, you know, most organizations you have to go through, whether you're going to you know, lock your computer with your password, what do you do if you get the wrong, you know, a phishing email and stuff like that. So now could we do that in virtual reality? And our point is, well, we don't really see what virtual reality brings to the table there because that's actually a screen based activity on your laptop and stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. So why would you introduce another mechanism to deliver that? Cause we can't see how that would have a positive impact and you'd just be putting money into something that's not going to make a difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just to scroll back in the chat a little bit, cause um, we've had lots of uh, folks drop in some awesome nuggets in there, um, including Cindy um, who's, um, dropped in a link about um, VR assisting with behavior change. So if folks haven't checked that link out yet. Um, and also Cindy mentioning that um, at, uh, at Baycrest Geriatric Hospital in Toronto, they created a virtual reality dementia simulation to help our medical students gain confidence and empathy in caring for persons with dementia. And I think I, I, and a couple of other you know items that have been dropped in uh, in the medical world, et cetera, um, I think a big value for, for VR is is creating the um, an environment where you can you can simulate risk without real risk, whether that's safety um, or even just you know physical safety, emotional safety um, in that kind of a, in that kind of a model where you can give people a chance to practice something without um, without actually being physically at risk, so that they are better prepared for that real situation when they do you know become at risk. That's uh, um, but I hadn't really myself hadn't really triggered too much on the, the behavioral and, and the more psychological kind of aspects of that usage too. That's really neat. Yeah, indeed. And I, I see that Jennifer's put and an, uh, mentioned saying that her experience is that creating VR is um, very labor intensive and, and expensive. And actually it still can. And that's been one of the challenges mm -hmm. for mass adoption. Um, yeah. It works really nicely for, like, say, innovation teams and business operations. They've got a particular process. They know they've got a problem with that. They may spend $200,000 on creating a training simulation, but they, by working out the efficiencies, they know that it could be $3 million quid a year of benefit. So that's an easy one, but it's not easy to do that bespoke activity across the enterprise um, for the mass population rather than niche departments. So... Yeah, we'll, we'll go into it in a little bit later, but we've actually started developing a bit of an answer to that, um, which then brings down the barrier for you know, for mass adoption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found from a from a um, one of the things I learned when I when I was really you know shoulder deep in it and and really into it was that the the selling point that was difficult was the incredible price tag of building the first one. And what I was trying to explain to everybody that well, I was, you know, at the time trying to convince to do it was that yes, building the first environment it is expensive because, but once you have that space created to build the things that your users are going to do, all the instructional stuff, all the different processes, is is significantly reduced so over time you have a big expenditure up front but it drops significantly really fast as you use it 
to create all the different processes and teach people different things in that environment. I'm thinking, of course, of, of a business case, like let's say you're doing warehousing or you know, a, a manufacturing process of some sort, right? Once you build that environment in a 3D space, now all you have to do is go in and code in all the processes or the things that you want them to do, right? And so, but it was still a hard sell, getting over that first hump of saying, yes, we need to recreate a, a real world space and that can be a little pricey. Uh, but once we've got it, that then becomes the tool. Yeah, and that's right. It's finding that straight line to you know, what's the outcome and you know, making sure that the return on investment is there. That's why it's typically easier around a particular business process. Yeah. Um, as opposed to an enterprise rollout of a particular sort of simulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, so what are the best, um, and we've talked a little bit about use cases and whatnot, but let's, let's talk just for a few minutes about what it, where you see the best industries, obviously defense and like, you know, pilots, it's the obvious one everybody puts out there. Right. And all that kind of stuff. And, uh, um, uh, medical simulations now are becoming pretty popular like what what else what's the what's the industry space where it seems to be gaining the most traction yeah it, a lot of it depends on use case as well so okay. when it comes to sort of more um process oriented type skills so, so manufacturing whether that's like fmcg um whether it's um pharmaceutical uh whatever it may be manufacturing tend to have a a number of requirements so they tend to have a, a lot of people they need to keep their people um, healthy and safe they tend to have repeatable processes and you know optimization those processes is essential um and so they're, they're sort of like really really sort of key ones for that what we're seeing in terms of some more the people skills communication um is actually more in around things like financial services, insurance companies, um, because they've rolled out to a mass, mass audience. You know, it could be 20,000 people and more being rolled out to. So, yeah, they're, they're sort of tend to be. Defense is a, is a big one. We don't operate within defense right now. Um, complex, uh, should we say, sector to navigate, very complex yeah. um, for smaller organizations like us. Um, but they've, they've got some great examples of how they're using it to, to simulate sort of, you know, wartime scenarios and how to change the odds in their favor and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the defense examples that I saw weren't even that um, uh, that level of complexity. One was a um, you, were, you had the goggles, but you had haptic gloves on, too. So you were actually reaching into and, um, and sorting out from a, um, a gun locker and then learning to take a gun apart so that, you know, prior to actually putting that weapon in someone's hands, they already knew how to assemble it and disassemble it, um, you know, prior to actually being uh, in a classroom with other folks. And the second one was um, for a, a new set of ships that the Canadian Navy was in the process of, uh, of bringing on uh, online, but they were being built. And so it was training for the mechanics. So they, again, haptic gloves and the, and the goggles on, but alarms go off, you're, you're in the engine room, um, an alarm goes off and you have to sort out. So you, you know, you were putting your hand on different pipes to figure out which engine combo was actually the one having so you got the vibration as if it was you know yeah. the way you the way it would actually work in the real world um, obviously you can't train people you know on in a ship that hasn't that doesn't really exist yet but working you know working from that vr then those folks would be theoretically ready to at least step in day one and not have you know be ready to to to, to run it and, and do all the the things that need to be done from that perspective it was really fascinating yeah, that's the the haptic gloves piece that you mentioned there. That's quite interesting. So one of our partners developed on our platform quite a um, quite a precise piece of training for cell and gene therapy. So, uh, and this is where you know some human matter. If you get this wrong within the process, you could be losing a million pounds of the human matter, um, and as well as all the um, the piping and stuff. And they they actually sort of deduce that these these haptic gloves aren't quite. Level, uh, ready for the level of precision, absolute precision yet, but they're very good in those situations, like you say, in terms of feeling and impact and stuff like that to actually increase the immersion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a Andrew's asking us, right, regarding assembling a gun, isn't there a tactile component to that, trying to do it in the dark without visuals? Um, yeah, so in the particular example that I saw, um, the tool knew, you know, if I put my fingers like this, that I was picking something up, for example, 
and I had a little bit of uh, vibrational sort of physicality to it. But um, and actually, actually, part of that too was that in the in the in the simulation um, on my wrist, I could in the in, within the thing poke on and get different info. I could you know watch a demo or whatever. So the the um, the the virtual reality hands that I was looking at, which is all I could see, you know, the the space that I was in. Um, and, and whatever weapon, and then the hands. Um, but that was then also a navigational element, you know, in the back of the hands, I get tapped to watch a demo or, or something like that, or get a hint or whatever, so. Amazing. Yeah. And, yeah, and so that, 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 that was like five years ago, almost now, so. Yeah. That's it, Richard uh, said about the haptic gloves, all about the tactile uses, yeah, exactly mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and you can actually get all like full on body suits and stuff like that now, right? So. You can actually have like you know in those wartime simulations you can feel like you've been shot in the arm or something it's like what well, it's quite crazy what what's going on you know what's possible now yeah mm. yeah yeah absolutely i i'll tell i'll tell everybody in the chat if you if you haven't had a chance i don't know if uh lee if you've actually been to it but there's an event in orlando every year that uh the military puts on and it's a it's a learning event but it's all about all of the training um, it's sec, I believe is what it's called. And I can never remember exactly what the darn acronym stands for. It's like the inter interdisciplinary you know, training and something it, it you know, training and I don't remember what it is, but basically it's every single military simulation company you can possibly imagine goes there and demos it. So if you really, really want to see, uh, yeah, Duncan, thank you. Yeah, it's sick. It, it is. If you if you really want to get into it and really in one confined space over a couple days, see the breadth of simulation work and, and training too. just, you know, the, the basic stuff we do in L&D and whatnot. That's that's the place to get overwhelmed immediately. I mean, it was um, it's it's an amazing, amazing event. So I would. I would encourage training professionals at least once in your life, try to get there. If you get a chance to go to a conference, once you've been to all ATD and the guild events and all, <laughs> all, the, all the standard ones, right? Uh, sorry. I don't want to, I don't want to keep people away from our industry's own events, but you know, to take, take some time and, and check out ITSEC. It, it's very, very cool. Yeah, Brent, we, you reminded uh, me of, um, you reminded me, Brent, the first time I actually had a VR related experience. And I think it might have been an event that you were one of the organizers of, but uh, um, there was, it was a combination of um, a university and uh, uh, maybe a company. And they had a giant ball, like a big the, hamster yeah, ball. And you'd put bad. the goggles on and you stepped <laughs> into the ball and they closed the door. And as you walked on the treadmill and the, the ball would then rotate. And if you turn, the ball would rotate. And so they were basically walking you through a virtual version of the university campus based on your own walking and turning and such. And uh, but you're in this, like this giant hamster ball. It was uh, you know black metal and stuff. And anyway, I'm not going to lie. Cool. Back, that, 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 it was very cool, but again, very you know basic graphical you know uh, experience. But the whole thing was about the fact that it was your actual you know your own use of your feet that were act was actually propelling you through the <laughs> through the simulation i never i wasn't in it long enough to know oh what happens if you get to the end or or whatever but uh you know a little yeah, does the world 30, keep 30 rebuilding experience yeah, yeah the, i think the military one that i used when i got inside the big gerbil ball was um they were long distances they were they were doing something about helping to train soldiers to if they had to you know run long distances you're literally running inside the gerbil ball and you can see the terrain and you can stop and hide behind things and run to the next thing so you could mm. physically get around a small town for example that they had rebuilt or something like that and you so you were physically knowing or at least feeling kind of how many steps it's going to take to get from one place to the next from one building to the next before they went in and uh and hit that little town for real and stuff like that it's it's uh yeah it, it was pretty intense but yeah tons yeah. tons of interesting technologies have have come and gone over the years <laughs> yeah they definitely we, we did one piece of work with the military so with the royal navy so our ceo was sort of like having breakfast with the first sea lord and the second sea lord of the royal navy i'm sure he, he wasn't quite sure how to behave but one of the 
the things that they need is obviously their submarines are usually out on sort of live live action. I'm not sure the, the terminology. So they wanted to train people for submarine usage in the teamwork environments. They were doing it in VR. So there's multiple people at different places of the submarine in the simulation at the same time. So whatever the first person did, it impacted the rest to see how they work together for a successful outcome. So quite advanced use cases as the military usually is. Um, but yeah, lots of capability there. Yeah, and that that simulation exercise that's all about uh, very much about the safety of of doing it without putting people oh in a boat underwater where things could go wrong really quickly if you weren't ready you know uh, and prepared and already uh, at a level of expertise on that very neat yeah yeah, yeah indeed yeah. let's uh, let's let's um, uh, we were going to hold off on something and until a little bit later in the conversation but let's hit that up now we're at about the 30 minute mark so maybe if you've got like an example or an image of something you can show give somebody a visual uh, I don't even know if we walked through sharing screens or anything we don't have to but we can still just talk about it if we want but let me yeah so one of the things again specific to people within LN and D again <coughs> going back is it's expensive takes time uh, to serve the the entire sort of population of the organization is very difficult and there just wasn't enough choice out there so we always found that the market wasn't working together so you have to operate with different providers everybody's got their different platforms and capabilities in the the market which is fragmented so what we've been doing over the last 12 months is we've been creating what we call a marketplace so we're not building the vr content it's a, a collection of vr content creators across the world where they're actually building off the shelf content typically in around um, where it could be mass um, adopted. So health and safety um, simulations and many, many people skill simulations. And we're, this is a bit of a sneak peek. We're launching it next month. So we're going to have about 120 different pieces of content that's instantly available on our platform. So the benefit to the content creators, they build it once and they've got the opportunity to monetize that many times. The opportunity for especially learning and development professionals is instant access to content that is easy to deploy and at a much reduced cost so you're not having a bespoke develop everything and we've been sort of testing and teasing the market with this and when we really think based on the feedback that we've got that this is actually going to be a big big help um to really serve a sort of mass population so i'm happy just to walk you through um a a web page that we've created it's not live yet so please you know you, you, nobody can access it but It'd just be good to get the feedback from people here to think whether that would yeah. be beneficial. Um, it's, it's, beneficial. it's interesting that you that you mentioned that because um, it's uh, I think for a long time, different companies that were selling a VR solution. The reason why the cost was so high was because you had to buy a super powerful computer that was pretty much out the re out of the reach of most people. You had to buy all the hardware. You had to get multiple pieces of software and you had to have multiple professionals that had different skill sets to pull all of those pieces together to build that environment and make that space. And so what I think I heard you saying is, is that in years there's, there's platforms now and then outside of that there's the ability to author environments and spaces that then can just be plugged in to the particular platform yeah so what our platform allows people to create content you still need do need development skills it allows sure. you to distribute it to users get the data on performance of individuals and look at trends across processes and cohorts and things and then actually to integrate it into a learning management system so whether that's for um, yeah, for just employee record or whether it's for a regulatory, it's got you know absolute timestamps on performance and when things are done. So other people, other agencies are building content and putting it onto our platform because of our reach. And they think, well, actually, they're going to monetize that quite nicely. And L&D professors are going, I can just have that, download it effectively immediately and then get it across my organization. I don't have to build it specifically. So that is that is our answer to you know those barriers that have always been in place. So, but how do I share my screen? Yeah, just roll your mouse over your own video um, feed, ah, and then there's a set of tools that pop up. Yep, and one of those looks like a little laptop with a an arrow. Brilliant, found it. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll only just sort of quickly sort of scoot through this. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it looks yep. great. Yeah, so so typically around 
you know people skills to developing people's um you know, so, so the softer skills as it were uh, all the way through to like life saving skills and things that typically you know almost any individual within an organization would benefit from right so not everybody's going to benefit from a particular manufacturing process that might be unique to 50 people as an example not to 50,000 that are actually in the organization yeah and there's lots of different you know lots of different areas here we see a lot around you know how to present to an audience how to pitch a business idea um things like gender inclusion and giving feedback and these are what the sort of market have been crying out for in our experience and what's really interesting and we've learned this through feedback from you know from our customers in the market is we've always focused on tracking individual performance you know to the nth degree is you know john smith did this training at this time he started it did all these interactions right here's his you know here was his score pass fail etc and integrate into a learning management system and we've always thought that it's massively important in some situations it is but in others um businesses are not wanting to identify their their users by name so as an example it might be things around sort of gender inclusion or bias or um, you know, racial equality and things like that. What they're not looking for is looking for the individual performance because it feels like they're trying to go on a bit of a, a witch hunt, as it were. What they're really looking for is to actually roll it out to the areas of the organisation and look for trends within particular um, with departments or geographies, whatever it may be, understand if there's a a challenge there then they can actually manage some level of intervention to actually get sort of the culture where they want it to be so we didn't see that it's the market has actually told us that that's actually quite important mm -hmm. rather than identifying somebody because if they failed on you know something that's a quite a um, sensitive matter it, they could almost be seen as a bit of a disciplinary offense but that isn't the purpose of it it's just trying to look at the culture as a whole so it's um it's, it's another description of, of the safety aspect where you want people to change so you don't yep. want the the process you want to encourage positive change rather than you know punitive yeah neat 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 um here's the question that uh, that's rattling around in, in my brain because you know we have um in, in your sort of typical e-learning or or other you know sort of standard training modes um you know there's some content then uh, probably typically there's you know some measure of, of what, how much learning took place an assessment and we can see in an e-learning course oh you could be a quiz or, or, or whatever um and i think it touches on uh, a little bit or connects to what you were just describing but um when, when folks are thinking about um how you know putting someone in a situation in, in a vr situation to learn a new set of skills how do you how do you measure let's say you know mastery or or um, you know, that, that skill was sufficiently obtained so, so you're ready to put them into the, the new world. Is it someone has to observe them in that VR world and confirm that they, you know, completed the tasks or uh, are there any other ways to do that? So it's a, it's a really good point. Typically, it's all very objective based. So the reporting is in within, within the application and the platform's tracking that all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's established up front. What is the, what is the measure of success? And then how do we actually evidence that within the reporting that comes out of the back end? So it might be just um, John or Julia you know, pulled that handle and did this and did that, did it all in the right sequences, keeping themselves safe. And at the end they go, they got it 100% right. So they're actually safe to go on the tools, if that makes sense. Um, if it was like 65%, it could have been a catastrophic event, which they would either have seen in the simulation or actually be reported back afterwards. So you've got objective, really clear objective criteria. But there's also the mechanism to sort of watch some of these things back or you can be involved in a multi a user ex, um, experience and you can actually it could be assessor led so assessor is actually watching you while you're doing it and seeing it from all the different perspectives and they can be marking you on again can be objective or it could be subjective be could be like well didn't like the way that john spoke to julia there but that's not going to be determined within um, objective data reporting that's more of a subjective piece that people pick up on so it's a combination of factors. Neato. And I guess some of that um, is is like, you know, if you've done the certain things in, in sequence and everything's correct, well, that's not unlike, um, you, you know, doing a, a regular simulation in a in a two-dimensional e-learning project or, uh, or or what have you. And, and you can even see how in a gaming model, you know, you have certain steps that achieve you certain things. So, yeah, very cool. Uh, sort of a lot of crossover there. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Brent. I was just going to say, we got a couple questions dropped in the ask a question section. I think we've hit on a couple of them, but Chris, do you see one, any of the three that jump out at you that you want to? 
to well, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm seeing Jennifer's question, which is sort of about what, how do you get into this if you if you have a, a, a limited budget, in a sense. Um, she's a bit more elaborate in her question, but I think that's the, the core kind of, you know, nugget. Um, so let, let's throw that out. I mean, possibly the, the sort of stock library kind of approach reduces the, you know, the, the, as you've described here, um, Lee, would, would, it would, be, would be one kind of way. But um, uh, where do you see people typically kind of starting then, if, especially, you know, being budget conscious? In this especially, yeah, especially in higher ed, she's mentioning specifically because mm. that's, that's where she works. So it, it's uh, how do we... How do we start getting this kind of thing more into the education space? Because it, it's always, you know, budgets are a horrible thing. <laughs> yeah, and a good point. So my wife's a director of education over here in the UK. So she has a number of schools that roll up uh, under sort of her, her guidance. And she has exactly the same challenge. She's like, again, VR can be amazing for the learning experience. She can see that but we just do not have the budgets available to be able to build our, our own bespoke content. It's too big, expensive, complex. So this is, this is really sort of our answer to it, really. It's about the more people that participate in the ecosystem, the more content that's going to be available, the more content that's available, the more sales will happen, the more sales will happen to bring the price point down. So it's this thing that's going to continue to sort of work together, and we're really starting to see the, the benefits of that now. Um, but it's a good point around higher ed. It's... Budgets are, you know, are not usually as as healthy as a, you know, a multi-billion-dollar, you know, highly profitable enterprise, right? In a in a, a lot of uh, enterprise cases, it's easier to make the the budget uh, decision because you are, you know, you have data that says this costs us this much. But if we invest this much, we can then, in, you know, it reduce those costs or or, or those risks, etc. Um, so sometimes the numbers are a little bit easier to come up with to. Uh, in in that kind of a space to figure these figure out the budget and, and the and oh yeah case. yeah in the in the semiconductor industry it was it was easy you know when people make a mistake they burn half a million dollars worth of product because they they moved mm. it wrong they they did something wrong with the machine or whatever so when you can say hey we trained people up to proficiency in you know, a quarter of the time that it used to take to get people to proficiency. Well, that's a savings right there. But then they're also better at their job. So they're not killing it, you know, burning as much product and all that kind of stuff. So then you got savings there. And when you start putting all those numbers together, you know, a, a, a half a million dollar development tr project for training starts to sound really enticing to the, the business folks as they're doing it. That was back then, right? I'm sure we could probably pull it off for a lot cheaper now, but um, the other thing too, that I was just thinking was the thing that struck me as you were talking, Lee, was, um, maybe this in the near future is going to be like the LinkedIn learning, but virtual reality, right? Yeah. So, so, right. Like cheaper. So it's like, you don't, instead of just going and watching a bunch of videos, now there's going to be a bunch of a lot more folks building different types of VR learning experiences and, and these big libraries. It'll be just as easy to jump into a bunch of free, uh, you know, um, ex you know, VR experiences in the same way that we currently now jump in and watch a bunch of videos on YouTube or, or you know, lynda.com or LinkedIn Learning and, uh, you know, all the other, you know, different libraries that are out there. I, I, I I look forward to that happening, but I'm I'm such a skeptic because I feel like I've been burned so long. But <laughs> yeah, it's, I, we definitely feel your pain on that one. And again, the feedback we're getting from the market is, you know, the sooner we can get to that level of proposition, the better. And yeah, you know, this is step by step. Right, this is this is very different to what's been done before. But we know there's so much more. We would love to have that consumption model or that subscription model where you pay X amount per employee and they you know, got almost like unlimited access to whatever training is available. But that needs a huge amount of participation from the market to do that. But you're absolutely right. And um, I think it was a guy mentioned around need a build platform yeah, for VR, but can also be used on a computer. That's actually a really good point. Again, I'm not trying to sell us at all, but our, our platform allows you to learn over the desktop um, as well as in VR. And you could you could have somebody on the desktop, somebody in the VR experience at the same time, coexisting, co-learning. Um, when it comes to, we've rolled out diversity and inclusion training for a large energy company, so, so tw over 20,000 people. They don't have 20,000 headsets. That's all done over the desktop. 
but they can also access it over a, a VR headset as well if they have access to one. So it is about that scalability for sure. Mm -hmm. Very, cool. very cool. Yeah, I think we forgot to mention to you that we, we have a tendency to wrap things up right about quarter to the top of the <laughs> hour. And I all of a sudden looked at the clock and I'm like, dang it, look at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, boy, give us a final wrap up of, of VR and where you see it. And, and just uh, if you can, you know, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, where are we headed in the next 12 months, 24 months? What, what do you think we're going to what's going to be happening? So I, I don't think we've hit that inflection point yet. Um, we've actually been having these conversations with people like Gartner and things like that as well. I think over the next 12 months, you're going to see the barriers to entry massively come down again. So headsets are going to become more affordable. They've all become, you know, wireless as it is. Um, there's going to be a much more content available that is, you know, instantly available. And there will be a lot more data and evidence of success. So one of the things that we typically struggle with is we've got customers who've got amazing successes, but they don't want to talk about it in the public forum because they use it as a competitive advantage. Yeah. So, but everybody wants some advocacy to be able to make the decision. So we'll see a lot of that gain in momentum so I think in the next 12, 24 months, it is going to be a totally different market and just much more accessible. Mm -hmm. Fantastically. Cool. Hey, you know what? Thank you so much for stepping in for Debbie. And again, for those of you that joined us late, Debbie had to go uh, and uh, take care of one of her clients uh, that, uh, that needed some extra help, love and care today. And she's just the person to take care of them. So thanks for hanging out with us. Well, thank yeah. you very much and good to meet everybody. Yeah, yeah. Lee, before we depart, or as we're dancing our way out of here, toss in, toss in some of your contact info if folks want to connect with you uh, outside of today's discussion here. Um, yeah, as yeah. always, thanks so much to our gang in the in the chat. You guys, um, as always, rock it, but there's some really cool links to, to catch up on. So if you joined us late, scroll back in the chat and, and check out some of the things that folks shared, et cetera, there. Um, and in the meantime, folks, have a great rest of the week. Uh, don't forget to check out the, uh, the the LinkedIn group and continue the conversation there. And as uh, as we often mention, uh, Idiotic is sponsored by Domino Learning Systems, makers of Domino One. So if that's of interest to you, um, I've just tossed a link into uh, you know to our free trial page there if it's uh, something that you're interested in following up with things. In the meantime, have a great time, and we'll connect with everybody again next week. Dance on out of here, gang. That's amazing. Indeed. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Lee. Really, really appreciate your time. Fantastic conversation. Appreciate it. It's my honor. Thank you. Chat, folks, we love you. Thanks for hanging out with us. We'll uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>